So I'm Casey Lai, and I lead products and global sales for primary data. So you call me if you want to buy something. Uh, but we actually want to um, kind of talk to you with some of the customer feedback we've gotten. In the last few months, we've been working with customers in terms of adopting primary data. And we've gone through everything from not just day-to-day -day use cases, usage scenarios, but also actually how to adopt the product into your environment. So. Um, rest assured, I think as Lance and David mentioned earlier, this is not a rip and replace. This is not only valid in a greenfield environment. Uh, we do have in-place assimilation techniques to also work with your existing environment. So one thing that we've been talking a lot about is the data virtualization and how that relates to SDS. And what we have at Primary Data is, in our opinion, uh, the most effective way to make SDS a reality through data virtualization. And we've been validating this with customers with the uh, techniques that we're using and how that actually changes and improves some of the use cases they have from a day-to-day -day perspective. So what I'm going to do is share with you some of the use cases and customer examples that we have across a variety of sizes of customers or a variety of uh, environments and a variety of use cases. So. In talking to one of our customers, a large global uh, financial institution, um, hundreds of thousands of virtual, virtual machines, uh, many hosts, uh, 100, over 140,000 virtual desktops. One of the things, uh, despite their size, despite all the money and all the people they had, one of the things they complained about was the problem of inefficient resource management or resource utilization. Uh, meaning, you know, in, in this particular example, only 20% of their entire storage was utilized. It's pretty shocking because this is multi, multi petabyte environment. Um, but it's not that surprising when you start thinking about all the different types of applications that they had. Um, the difficulty in trying to troubleshoot and understand <coughs> where performance bottlenecks are. And so you have a lot of over provisioning that happens to ensure uh, performance. And also you have a lot of silos and containers that you create to isolate uh, certain applications from being stepped on by others. And so it becomes very labor intensive to try and figure out when things go wrong and try to figure out how to resolve that. So with primary data, one of the things that we can do really well that David touched upon earlier was this intuitive yet robust policy engine to let you set rules to avoid these things from happening so that you can actually have specific service level objectives tied to specific applications, specific files, users, file types, etc. so that things like having to over provision for performance simply doesn't happen anymore. And it allows you to now better leverage and utilize the existing inv investments that you already have and with the policy-based data mobility to understand where the free storage is and where the uh, most appropriate storage to match the most appropriate type of workloads so that allow you to move the data to the right place at the right time. Um, so overall, that allows them to improve the application responsiveness as well as get more out of their existing environment without having to make additional storage investments. By the way, it can be interactive on the customers. We just don't have permission to give the names. Well, but we're on. They're reals. We're we're, we're, we, we're we've been um, figuring it out. Yeah, we're on um, camera, so we don't want you to necessarily say yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. right now. Right. But we are. Questions for these specific. We are relatively confident. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll talk that. afterwards. <laughs> appreciate it. Thank you. And another customer is a large semiconductor, uh, you know, Fortune 500 customer. One of their challenges is really around visibility. So they have a lot of data, and they have a lot of data in different locations. And in order to kind of control for the cost of their data growth, um, they're having a hard time understanding what data needs to be protected for how long and what on what type of storage. And because of the high cost of managing all that data and the growth, and not really having a data-driven way to determine what needs to be backed up, what needs to be archived, how long you keep something, and what type of storage to keep it on, shockingly, <laughs> In their environment, over 600 terabytes is actually not centrally managed by IT. Just 600, though? I mean, that's not a lot. Uh, well, in this particular maybe, case. Maybe for them, it's a lot as of a data. Percentage, <laughs> as a percentage of data, so it's probably around 50% for them. So imagine having 50% of your environment not being centrally managed by IT. So in small islands that are managed by individuals and not having the same levels of reliability and protection. Sure. I wanted to make sure it was 600 terabytes, not 600 petabytes, and it was just a typo because <laughs> it's like 
you know, some of us could have that at home. Sure. Sure. <laughs> We're not saying who. We're not saying who. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna ask what type of what type of data it is. Must really like kittens. <laughs> and, and I don't have a home lab. <laughs> I just have a lab lab. <laughs> and also, one of the challenges for them is, um, like a lot of uh, large or enterprise companies, you know, they have a lot of different vendors. They have EMC VMAX for production storage, pure storage for databases. They have NetApp for their filers. They have Nexenta. Uh, they have cheap quantum storage. And then they have different types of cloud. They have uh, God, sounds like Citibank. AWS, Azure. <laughs> and then there's backup. And then there's backup. That's the thing. <laughs> we, we didn't even get to backup yet. Then there's different types of backup. There's different types of archiving solutions. And so all that makes it really complex. And where David was going with earlier is, well, imagine if you, the same policies that you set on file placement to optimize performance, to optimize cost, and the same policies that you set on file mobility to move it to get better placement or better uh, cost, extend that to creating policies on retention. Extend that to creating extra copies when you need to. Extend that to when you need to archive something or when you might need to delete something. So we, in a way, allow them to achieve this unified data protection solution already integrated in primary data. So for them, what they're really excited about is having a really hard you know, TCO in terms of being able to not just simplify the environment, but also displace all the mis mishmash of the different backup and recovery solutions they have in their environment as well. Can we go back to the previous example? I was going to say either one would, would, doesn't really matter, but that one might be easier. Um, how has it changed the, their operational processes? So things like billing, um, <coughs> things like change control, um, and all those things that would be possibly more easy to do with discrete components where data isn't just dispersed everywhere. Mm -hmm. how, how, how's it, do, have they actually sat down and looked at the impact of that to themselves? So one of the things that the feedback we've gotten is, you know, we can actually make chargebacks a lot simpler because of now the granularity and visibility into all applications and all files across all devices. So it becomes a centralized way of actually seeing all that to, you know, do all your billing and your chargeback. Now we don't stop and we don't break existing processes. So whatever chargeback processes that they have, for example, in their current storage, that will still work. Yeah, so, I'm sure it would. Yeah. But, but but for example, if they've got 10% here, 20% here, and all on different things, mm -hmm. and it might be changing on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis, and they were using some sort of physical basis for that charging, that would then become inappropriate, and you'd need to move to more of a service-based mm -hmm. model that Correct. says this tier right. gets this storage. I just wonder whether that's something that they took as an advantage to do that, or whether they were already at that place anyway, and they didn't need to. Yeah, so with this company, um, they're, they're pretty advanced. Uh, so they have their own homegrown uh, applications and scripts that they use to do something like that. Um, we complement that, right? So earlier in the demo from Siddharth, you saw that before you made a change <coughs> that would have invoked a movement, we can actually advise you on the ramification of that movement. We can actually say, hey, it's cool. I I'm happy to move 50 <coughs> terabytes for you. But the cost difference from going from SATA to Flash is x. And the time that it takes to do that is y you still want to do that. Uh, whereas today, you don't really have that knowledge until after the fact you do it, and you have to deal with the ramifications of that action. So we do very nicely play within that model, but giving you even more data into how that's going to impact your operations. So can we, can we stand that customer tip for sure. just a second? So that's obviously a large enough environment that that was not a greenfield opportunity. This Correct. is where primary data was added to some existing infrastructure. Correct. Can you talk about how you do that in order to minimize its disruptiveness? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it, I mean, obviously it needs to go somewhere in between the app and the storage. So there's, yeah. so there's probably some disruption. There, so it's actually, um, we, we probably may want to have another session where we can go more into detail, but I'll give you the kind of the high level overview. So once the data director is set up, right, you establish mount connection to the existing client's hosts that you have. Um, and you also have the existing storage you have that you want to establish a mount to the data director. So there obviously has to be a, a process in which you, know, you do unmount from the existing uh, storage to your clients, you mount the data director. Once that happens between the data director and the storage, 
we do an in-place assimilation. So no, you know, no forklift upgrade, no rough migration. You don't have to buy an extra swing box just to do that. We do an in-place assimilation just so we can see the metadata and tag the metadata of all the files. Once that happens, we remount the, uh, the storage back to the clients again. Everything's now working just the way it was, but now the primary data data director actually, or MDS, actually has visibility for all the metadata and can apply policies now for all those files in your existing environment. Okay, so I'm going to have to schedule a downtime to stop my app, but it's not going to need to be down long because I'm just going to unmount and then, am I mounting back the same point from storage or am I mounting it again now through primary data so instead? It's, 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 it's both. The data path ends up being mounted the same way, but the metadata is mounting the MDS. Okay. So but, but the I, primary but thing I, it's seeing is this, and then it's automatically giving the subroutes to get to the data. So my individual app might be down a couple minutes right. in order to... Mm -hmm. to right. And it, okay. right, and it should be the last time you ever have to take Correct. it offline to take your storage offline because you can do live sure. migration while yes, it's accessing well, it in the future. It should survive but once I'm virtualized, but yes. I'm virtual. But yeah. I, I, I like the goal and the idea, yes. yes. So, so but supporting Linux, Windows, PSXI, <laughs> and whatever. Those, are, those, those, those are the major flavors. Oh, uh, okay, for but... Release, yes. but Already in production. ESX no. barely supports NFS 4, let alone PNFS. So I get how this works in a Linux environment with a PNFS client. Are are you mounting an IFS in ESXi to? So so in the case of VMware where you have client hosts that are not on uh, uh, NFS four, that's where David talked about the portal approach. Uh, we could which is located on the same box. Which is located on the same box, so right? So it allows on, us to do that. On the metadata box, or it runs so as a VM on, on, on the ESX on host. ESA. Okay, oh. so okay, there's oh. like a, so, so there's a router VM plugins or yeah, yeah, yes, okay, yeah, as a wow. as a guest till till VMware gets their act together and supports exactly. PNFS, which oh never. But the beauty is, the uh, guest, yeah, I was saying that about NFS four too. So you know, it's there's probably two, only there's another two, decade. There's two right? options there. One one is the 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 guest, which does the the translation. Uh, but if you have your, your guest operating system is going to be Linux or Windows, it can have the enhanced client and therefore bypass the whole mess of having to go through the ESX hypervisor in right. the first place. Yeah. So I'll need that portal oh, on, okay. on each ESXi right. host. That's right. Okay. The portal sits on each one of those and routes the data for the guests on there uh, if those guests are going through ESX to get to uh, the storage. But if, if the guest itself wants to go directly to the data space, all he has to do is load the client and bypass the ESX hypervisor in yeah. the first place. So. Uh, another customer we're working with is a, um, well, we went through that one, is uh, one of the top 100 hospitals uh, in America with uh, petabytes of information. And you know, in their words, it's, uh, it's really hard and it's really costly to deal with the exponential growth of data that they have. Um, especially uh, when it comes to trying to figure out the balance between cold data and uh, ar archiving cold, uh, hot data and archiving cold data. And so one of the things that they have, you know, obviously they have EMC VMAX, they have your NetApp, and they have <laughs> EMC Centera as their on-site archiving platform. Sorry to hear that. Uh, it's really hard for them to figure out exactly um, how much can go on the Centera because it's uh, the Centera uh, uses you know source one to determine you know basically you know time of access and they need a little bit more granularity than that number one uh, number two as the data grows it's hard for them to scale and grow and add more Centeras and manage it seamlessly so they're looking at cloud as a way to integrate into their existing environment and say hey could I either replace Centera or maybe can I have two archived tiers you know one for Centera and one leverage the cloud and so obviously to do that there you know there's some challenges one is like David said you know how do you now do this within all the same global data space uh, because with archive there's still if you're a hospital you still have HIPAA compliance rules you want to be able to find things very quickly um, and so one of the advantages we bring is allowing them to work with not only one cloud provider but different cloud providers and so having that archive tier in the same global data space as their production tier. 
and then to further help reduce costs, we could help uh, with our policy engine identify candidates of files on the expensive storage, tier one storage, that could be migrated uh, to the tier two storage. Uh, again, it's hard to do today because they're separate solutions on separate namespaces. That, allow, that becomes possible with us, which now allows them to reclaim expensive storage uh, and has a huge cost avoidance on the storage that they have because without this, you know, one of their comments to us was, it's really expensive as they grow and they do these tech refreshes. They seem to just go from one VMAX into a bigger VMAX. Um, so it just gets more expensive and more complicated and doesn't really solve the problem that they have. And so they're very interested in having working with us to having that unified policy span from both production, uh, tier two, and even into the cloud. This other customer is a Fortune 150 technology company, um, very large, both virtualization as well as Oracle, um, with a, also a lot of EDA workloads. And you know, in their words, you know, trying to manage eight large data centers uh, with 50 uh, petabytes of data across them is a quote unquote nightmare. Um, and it gets very, very different, very, very difficult to actually predict uh, performance levels across so many sites with so many end users, different time zones, different geographies, different latencies, um, and dealing with such huge amounts of data. In fact, um, they're so big that they've actually broken NetApp cluster mode. Uh, to the point where even NetApp has actually said, you're, you're going, well, that's not hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think anybody at the table is shocked. <laughs> so well, what was interesting for us was they deployed cluster mode, and they were one of NetApp's biggest cluster mode customers. And because of the complexity and the performance actually became so bad, they actually had to take out cluster mode. Uh, in a lot of the environments and say... People in this room have broken Isilon, so I mean, it <laughs> doesn't take much to break a massive clustered file system. It's, yep. you know, it's what you do when you get past that point. Exactly. So what they would love us for, for us to help them out with is uh, to simplify that scale out environment, right? So one of the practical use cases primary data has, we talked about being able to support heterogeneous storage. Well, in the case of NetApp, think about being able to give NetApp you know, clustering capabilities without having to upgrade to cluster mode, without having to deal with that level of complexity. And that's something that both NetApp customers and partners have actually told us, hey, that could be a huge value. I can take my existing standalone filers they are today and create a, put them under primary data, make a cluster out of them as a seamless global namespace, and that allows them to scale out without any disruption in their environment. So they're going to use you to out cluster mode cluster mode? No, this, is, <laughs> this is allows us to keep seven mode. <laughs> it was my takeaway. <laughs> It, it also allows them to, one of the reasons why they want the ability to cluster is when you have so many sites, one of the challenges is trying to ensure performance levels at all those different sites. And if you have a glo unified global data space and with the policy engine to determine when to actually move the appropriate data to the appropriate sites, based upon usage, user profile, et cetera, it allows them to more dynamically respond to the, use, the needs of the developers uh, without being reactive, which is what's happening today. And being reactive leads them to over-provision and saying, I, I'm tired of hearing the complaints, just here, here's more nodes, here's more storage, go. Uh, that's becoming harder and harder to solve. One important point about out cluster moding NetApp is that for the first time, we have in the protocol the feedback loop to tell us the end-to-end -end performance we're getting. Mm -hmm. So before then, it was it was really a fool's errand to try to make something like this work. But with the feedback loop, actually no, seeing totally the good. performance the client's getting, you can manage and move data to the right place. Yeah, I mean, compared to the previous attempts at this kind of thing, yeah, at knowing how fast your backend pieces are, rather than letting the administrator tell you how fast the back-end pieces are is a big difference. Yes, yes. And being able to make those data-driven decisions to make the changes yeah. you need. Uh, much, much more reactive. Absolutely, absolutely. 